All right, let's see what we got gonna happen today. Ah, uh, what was your aha moment in audio? Well, I guess technically kind of always been in the audio, you know? Uh, I mean, this probably goes for Eric as well. I remember being like five or six years old and uh, and listening to uh, your uh, 801 Series 2 BMWs in the in the basement they had yeah. set up. And I remember always asking you to uh, to play a, a bass-heavy track. It would make, you know, the whole room oh, yeah. shake. We like that. And uh, I think that's where it started because, like, I, I always remember that um as being like something that we always wanted to do and at the time you didn't it wasn't really about music you just it was fun you know so i think that's what started the whole thing of just wanting to have fun um yeah. in audio i hear you with the bass i remember uh those speakers are like those speakers were like having two subwoofers in the room you know they were i think the only one of the few speakers you see around back in the day that went down to like 20 hertz flat and um they were exciting for me too i remember first designing this isn't my first, but I remember designing when I started designing cables using those speakers and the difference you could make with uh, those, the bass, just, I remember sitting in front of that speaker in awe when I changed the speaker cables to the, what I was working on. I was just like, holy crap. It just get, could get so defined with such a good speaker like that. You didn't even realize how, how good it could get type thing, you know? And it was just like, uh, same as probably same as you when you were five, I'm sitting there I was in my late twenties and I'm going, man, this is pretty good, you know, but uh, anyway, back to the beginning. So Eric, you got a, you got a beginning. Yeah. So for me, I think there's a few parts to this because I guess in our situation, we grew up around audio, which is somewhat atypical. Um, and I went to trade shows like CES a few times before I was really in the industry. So I've been kind of immersed in audio and hi-fi for, for quite a while, I guess pretty much my whole life, but to me, that was normal. So yeah, I, really. I think the threshold is raised quite a bit in my situation because I'm I'll talk about what basically made me break above that. What made me consider music and audio and something like that to be more interesting than I already did at the time. And I think there's a few parts to that for me. So one of the more important moments was I started to get really into music um, in the early days of college. I had a semester where I had like four hours or something like that between classes, two days of the week. And it's really not enough to leave and come back because parking was a challenge. So it wasn't really practical to do anything other than stay. And if I didn't have anything really serious to get done, I had a bunch of hours twice a week or so um, with nothing going on. And I stumbled on uh, some music communities, I guess you would say. And um, a lot of enthusiastic individuals talking about music and uh, I got really involved. Uh, I started fumbling around and finding new music that I was interested in and I spent a fair bit of time uh, trying out new artists and stuff like that and figuring out what I really liked and to me that I haven't really done anything like that before and this may seem trivial now but it was much more challenging 10 plus years ago to do this kind of thing. Um, there wasn't really streaming services that had great availability of all different artists and stuff like that. It, it was much harder to find music um, other than like personal referrals, recommendations to friends. Other than the stuff the old man had. Yeah. Right. Like it wasn't, <laughs> there was nobody knocking at your door to try to get you to listen to some particular music. If it wasn't on the radio and your friends didn't listen to it for whatever reason, it wasn't really a thing a lot of people were too aware of. Today, you see a lot of private music, um, like paid subscription services, try to serve you more and more music so you spend more time on their platform and whatnot. And I think that makes it a hell of a lot easier and that's wonderful, but um, it was much more challenging in, in just 10 years ago or so. Um, but for me, I think that was the first point that I started to realize that was something I was really interested in. I spent an actual considerable amount of time looking around and exploring uh, new artists and stuff like that. And I was, there, you know, there was a basically a little forum community thing that I was in discussion with. And we had some, I was following threads and stuff like that and seeing, uh, seeing what other people were interested in to try to find out what artists and, and albums I might be interested in myself. And I found quite a few things that I really liked and I explored that avenue quite thoroughly. Did that jog anything in your memory, Jason, like uh, stuff like that? Well, it, it, more of recently is you realize how spoiled you are now and how easy it is 
to to get served up new stuff you never heard anymore. But yeah, really. yeah, in the in the early days, yeah, it was just whatever you had on hand is what you're listening to. Yeah, over and so, over. So it's a lot easier now. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's too easy. It's too much. There's so much stuff to listen to. I I know that you could spend multiple lifetimes trying to cover the stuff that's out there. It's crazy. In addition to that, though, past just getting into music and getting someone more interested in it, I think it was when I first started seeing people on forums talking about our headphones. And so at this point, we went to maybe two trade shows or maybe only one. We went to a few trade shows, I think, before we started actually shipping in any real volume of the, the 1266. And I think it was when I started seeing people talk about our headphones that we were making and seeing what they were saying, uh, for me, that changed it a bit for me. I, I thought it was a pretty cool thing at the time, but um, it took so long. There wasn't like a, there wasn't a strong transition. You know, I was working on it for many years. And so to me, it was obvious. Um, it was clear that it was a pretty good headphone, right? Cause we've seen yeah. it over and over again for years. So people were saying that it's good. It's that wasn't shocking to me. That wasn't insightful knowledge of, I'm happy that they, they liked them, but there was there was so much more depth to the community than I initially expected. Um, well, yeah, you were more immersed in the engineering side of it, and we were right. designing it where than you were. You never got a chance to really jumpstart yourself and heavily in the audio side of it, I guess you know. But yeah. um, I wasn't familiar with the the headphone industry, I guess you would say at that point. Um, I knew two channel a bit. I went to a bunch of shows, talked with people and stuff like that. Uh, so I had some understanding of two channel at that point, but um, headphones, that was a new experience for me. I didn't know how different it would be. The people that were attracted to the personal audio scene are very different um, than what you get in two channel. Yeah. And, Jason uh, had a bit of jump on you because he was doing trade shows with me. I think while you were still going to college, right? Yeah. Did yeah you do a some... few years before. Yeah, so we were doing, I don't know, did you ever do a Stereophile show with me? I don't even know. Me? We, no, oh, we, we went, been the one, but I didn't, I never did yeah. one. So it was, uh, those ended, I think, in 07 or 08. So I think it was right after that, maybe you started doing Rocky Mountain, CES. Yeah, sometime maybe. around then. Yeah, I'm like, come with me, man, I need help. I had enough setting up all these systems myself. Yeah, and then shortly after, that's where we went to our first Can Jam that we didn't show at. Oh, we right. Checked it out. Yeah. yeah. But I think to get kind of the question um but related more to headphones i'd say um it was it was the f after the f many or initial revisions of the headphone that they actually started like oh we could actually make this sound good that was exciting and it you know you could yeah. we kept trying to make it better and better at a very rapid pace just yeah. because we were excited you wanted it to sound better for your own listening you know right so i think that that early point was uh it was very rapid development. Once I want to sound like this. Yeah, well, you need to no, sound we, like this. But it had to get to the point where you're like, oh, we can work with this, and that—that right. that was the hard part to getting to the the initial. Oh, this is pretty good. Now let's refine it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. For me, there was a lot of challenges there because it would be, I think, tricky to understand this from a consumer perspective. But you know, I was pretty intrinsic in the design from the early stages, and so I saw its evolution and that kind of lends itself to be challenging to be satisfied with the end result there's always something to improve right there's always some way you could make something better um and so i think it really was for me at least when it started going into customers hands and seeing what they were saying about it that was that was an interesting moment um that was when i thought that it was reassuring that other people were pretty happy with it as well um yeah i hear you well, I think I think especially since you saw every revision, every little incremental improvement, that uh, the end result just seemed normal to you because you you just slowly saw the changes. Right. But for everybody else, it's like this is a whole new thing. Um, right. So yeah, you kind of lose perspective um, when you're yeah. making a headphone. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, I guess I should probably talk. I, the first time, the first thing I can remember is being a little kid, and. Um, I barely, I don't really remember childhood too much. For whatever reason, I just don't remember much of it, but I remember pieces of it. I remember we had this big console TV, which back in the day was a, a 25 inch tube in the middle of this six foot long thing, you know, with speakers at either side, basically just paper driver speakers. And it had a, on one side, I think it had an AM FM tuner and the other side had a, a turntable. So it was an all in one, you know, uh, you've probably seen them in uh, some of these, um, 
garage sales or something. You know, people are trying to get them out the basement. They've been there for for a hundred years. But uh, anyway, when I was a kid, I would sit on the floor. And I mean, basically, when you're sitting on a floor, you're at ear level with these speakers on this console TV. And, you know, and it was cool to sit there on the floor and just listen to music. And um, so I, that's probably what really got me going into it back then, you know, got my brain engrams or whatever they're called, uh, thinking toward music. And the next thing I remember, the next thing I remember being excited about is I think my first communion. Yeah, the first communion, they gave me uh, for a gift, I got a GE portable radio it was an am fm cassette so it lets you record to tape from the radio so you could listen listen to radio which i've you know i don't even know if we had a clock radio in the house so i you know other than that console tv which wasn't on all the time really unless you're watching tv we didn't really play a ton of music on it my, my parents had albums like uh uh you know i remember the labels i remember seeing the labels on the albums how i think i was walking on the albums on the floor when I when they weren't around, you know, you put them on a the floor and walk from album now, but I guess they didn't weigh enough to break them. But um, I remember like a turtle, a turtle label. I forgot what the name of the label was. It was like uh, they listened to things like Ag Engelbert Humperdinkel or, or Dink, yeah, whatever his name was, and things like that. But anyway, the next one was uh, Communion. I got this radio, so now I can listen to music at will anywhere in the yard outside with battery, right, and record it too. So now I'm all of a sudden now I'm recording shit that I'm listening to. I'm listening. Oh, I like this station. I like this song. I'm making tapes, and that was that basically brought me in as kind of wanted to be a a DJ type thing, you know. And uh, that took me all the way to high school, really, because man, I remember like twelfth grade. I was the I was the I had the boombox on the bus. I built um, out of a car radio and a and a small twelve volt battery. I built out of solid pine a boombox with two car speakers. A car radio, I'm from car radio, and a friggin' big battery, you know? Hell, it even had a little pump in a tank in it that you could put, like, liquor or something in it if you wanted to, and you pump it in and out, you wouldn't even know there's anything inside of it. You know, just, it had a little, like, a quart container. That was a, I think that was an add-on. I, I added that later, but but I'd be on the bus, you know, we'd be going to school and shit, and I'd be cranking the tunes in the bus, and I would actually, while I was doing homework at home, I would record the tunes off the radio to tape. So, basically, every day... I'd have my selection of tunes, a different set of tunes all the time on the bus. So everyone thought it was pretty cool, you know, until I got my first car and I didn't show up on the bus anymore. I was like, man, where are the tunes? So, uh, but yeah, and obviously it just grew from there. But uh, yeah, those are the two moments I could really think of. Is, uh, and I think that's key when you think about it is like, you know, people should, people, parents, uncles, aunts, whatever, should always make sure that there's music in a child's life. You know, they should give you something to go with, you know, even if it is just a radio, right? Or nowadays, I don't even know what the hell you give kids. I mean, what, what do they just need a pair of Bluetooth headphones, right? Or earbuds. It's yeah. even simpler now. Hell, um, you don't have to give them much. Most kids already have phones. So, uh, yeah, just get them, get them involved with it. Give them, give them money to buy music, something, you know, uh, to promote it. Because it's obviously, it obviously sticks with all of us for our whole life, which is pretty wild when you think about it, you know? Well, seems like good a place as any to wrap it up. So if you like videos like this, feel free to let us know. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And stay tuned for the next one. Bye.